Today, I'm going to talk to you about the four and six legged pests of hemp. And I'm referring specifically to um, uh, hemp rosette mites and uh, aphids and corn earworm. So then the hemp rosette mites is a little bit different from the other mite species, even from spider mites and from ticks, because they share only two pair of legs. And in addition, they are microscopic. They can get up to 200 microns on your size, as you can see here. And you can compare this size with an egg of the spider mite, very tiny. So that's the reason why you need to have a lens, a magnification lens, and that's very important. So one aspect with this mite is how are they spreading across different states? And this is due to the trade of plants. So many clone plants are producing in, in single uh, 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 areas where uh, they are selling across different uh, parts. On, and that's how I was able to get a colony. So also in addition to that, we have a wind dispersion. I don't know if you were able to see this uh, uh, small movie, but you can see a lot of activity in this, in this, in this leaf. And uh, at the edge of the leaves, you can see that some of the mites are, uh, are, have a sucker at the end of the body. And with this sucker, they attach the leaf and then they wait for the wind to be uh, uh, carried away. So that's another way of wind dispersion. But I believe the, uh, the most important dispersion right now is the commercial trade of plants. So uh, there are many things that we are learning. And one of the issues is how to study these insects uh, to conduct uh, research. So one of the deals is how to probably infect plants. And we did some infection of plants. And you can see here, this is the control plant on the right versus the plants that were inoculated or infested with the hembrosent mites. And there were some effects. There, uh, these uh, hembrosent mites uh, reduce the growth of plants. You can see here the height, how uh, the control plants are probably almost twice as large as the plants that have the hembrosent mites. And also they, re they reduce the number of leaf pairs. So each of these nodes has a leaf pair. So here, and you can see the hembros and mites have a reduction of the, on this, this situation. So in addition, also we observed the very normal previously described a situation when the plants are very heavily infested. You see the folding of the leaves upward. So as you can see here in Top, these top leaves, but also on some cases the leaves are, are, are downward, as you can see the edges here on the bottom. So uh, we did some scouting in Princeton and also in Lexington, but due to the COVID situation, we only went to, uh, to Lexington twice. And the main purpose for this was to scout for cornier worm. And, um, in this case, uh, there were four varieties of hemp uh, that was mentioned in, before yesterday. And while I was scouting for hemp, for, 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 for corner worms, we noticed that there were some plants that have this kind of uh, a black specks. So you can see here, I'm using a head lens. So that's very important. And then what we did is we took uh, uh, 10 centimeters in fluorescence to the laboratory from Lexington to Princeton. So and then there we conducted the studies. Once in the laboratory, we noticed that uh, most of the damage or most of the, these uh, rusted mites were present in the inflorescence rather than in the leaves that you can see here. Furthermore, this inflorescence have a kind of a leaf morphology that's very uh, particular. So they have leaves of first order, second order, and third order. So, we decided to evaluate these ones. So first of all, in Princeton with these plants from Lexington, we were able to find that some of the inflorescences were healthy. So you see here, no presence of very few numbers of rusted mites. You see the plants here, but also we observed again, leaves and peduncles and petioles that very, that they're on the inflorescence were, that were infested with hemp rusted mites. But furthermore, some of the rusted mites are shown here, very healthy. The other ones were uh, probably infected 
with uh, um, entomopathogenic fungi, fungi, as you can see here. And this fungus was previously described. We don't know what's the species in this case. Uh, prior studies, they show that Hirsutella thompsoni or Beaveria bassiana, they are effective to controlling uh, uh, spider mites or rusted mites, but also some of these affect the, ni the natural predatory mites. So currently, the, the spacings that we collected were sent for identification to Georgia, and we are waiting for those results. So once we were in Princeton, these are the tallies for the third order leaves, and these were the leaves that has uh, higher numbers compared to the well-developed leaves. So you can see here that in most cases, all the plant, all the, these leaves have dead rusted mites or rusted mites that were alive here. The ones that have the lower numbers were the T1 cultivar. But also we observed that the peduncles and the petioles, the peduncles is the stem that support the inflorescence and the petioles are the stem that, that support the, the, the leaf. So they have higher numbers than even the leaves. So it, this means that uh, these uh, rusted mice were moving from the leaves out to the, probably to the, to the flowers. So to cause them heavy damage. And you can see here, there were highest numbers. They reach up to 400 compared to 40 numbers, number 40 on the, on the leaves. So again, we found here dead rusted mites, live rusted, rusted mites, on both petioles and peduncles. And again, the lowest ones were in the T1 cultivar. Now, I don't know if this cultivar is resisting. We, I need to do further evaluation on this one. So uh, also uh, last year, we reported the presence of the cannabis aphid. And, uh, and this is an aphid that is specific to hemp. So we again did some inoculations of uh, or infestation of plants on the laboratory. And you can see here if plants that were infested with one aphid per plant. These are small plants, two aphids per plant and three aphids per plant. And you can see that this, if they are not controlled, so these aphids can kill the plants in less than two weeks probably. So you can see here. So this is the data where we collected in, in 28 days on the bottom. And this is the number of aphids per, per the, the the middle uh, leaflet actually. And you can see here on the three aphids per plant, all the populations almost reach a kind of seminal, similar levels at seven days. But then after that, on the ones that we release three aphids, the population decrease. And this decree, this uh, reduction of population is due to the, these plants are going, are almost dying, okay? In addition to that, also we try to find some uh, uh, research-based data on how long that these insects develop. So there's no reports on that. We found that at 21 and 25 degrees Celsius, these aphids complete the life cycle in 5.6 and 4.5 days. So they are very rapid. So they have a uh, rapid uh, population growth in the laboratories. So furthermore, so they are also very prolific. So we only check up to 15 days and they have uh, high reproduction rates. Also, uh, we tested some natural enemies uh, on how can they uh, uh, complete the life cycle only living on this, only feeding on these uh, aphids. And we have the Coleomagilla maculata this is the pink lady, very common here in, in Western Kentucky. Cyclonella sanguinea and Harmonia xylidis. This is the Asian lady beetle. All of them were able to complete the, the, the life cycle only on this diet. We didn't check here reproduction, but uh, they were able to lay some eggs. Now, uh, also I did evaluate the effects of some uh, registered insecticides on the cannabis aphid. And we tested uh, Margosa and Asadirectin. Margosa oil is extracts of the neem seeds, whereas uh, Asadirectin is a second hemp metabolite that's more complex to, for, for, for extraction. And we have these compounds. 
Uh, this is the active compounds and the rates here. And you see that there is uh, oil, oils of margosa at 70%. Then there is combination with acidiractin. This one, the second one has 70% of acidiractin and so on. So as you can see here, the results, that's at 20 days, you see that the lowest numbers of aphids are on the product that has 70% of acidiractin. Now uh, we're moving into caterpillars found in hemp and uh, checking for these ones, we found commonly the conger worm, the yellow striped caterpillars, and the common gray moths and Virginia tiger moths. These two, the later ones, are probably not causing too much damage, but they were present there. And in addition, also we found the Eurasian hemp border that what we reported last year, but this time we're finding the kills. And also we're finding the European corn border. And this was also found by Dr. Pierce uh, in, in some other areas of Kentucky. So, Again, here we are learning how to tally these insects for aphids or grass mites and so on in hemp. And remember that hemp is a very high uh, value plant. So it's $3 per plant. So you cannot go to the field and sweep a net and destroy the plant. So you cannot do that. So what we did is we recorded the numbers of caterpillars checking for the entire plant and also we recorded the time spent per plant per larvae. And in this case, we count, we have two people per plant. So and we time these ones. So and this is the kind of plants that we are calling healthy plants versus damaged plant. On the healthy plants, you cannot see actually uh, damage caused by the, by the conure worm. On the damaged plant, you can see some frost and some dry leaves. So we try to evaluate the numbers on that one. So, and this was done uh, in Princeton, in a field that we have here uh, with a, a producer. And these are the results. So on the healthy plants, we only found very few caterpillars. So you can, when you go to the field, you can see that they are present there. So that's very interesting on this, in this aspect. So visually, you can kind of uh, project the numbers of, or, or evaluate the numbers. So, but also in the damaged plant, you see that we found up to seven corn earworms. And this one done evaluating the entire plant and then timing it. So the time utilized for the healthy plants were three minutes, 20 seconds, whereas the damaged plants was 40 minutes, 30 seconds. So I'm not so sure this is correct, but this is what we are doing right now. Now, when we, we, we went to, 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 to Lexington, so we have that data on the time, so we decided to use time counting of, for caterpillars on these large plots that Dr. Pierce have. So we use only two minutes per plant and we count all the caterpillars that we can find. And this was random. It was not, we didn't select healthy versus uh, uh, damaged plants. We, we randomly walked to the field and then we selected them. So this is what we have. We have corn worms present in most of the different cultivars except endurance. And also in addition to that, we rated the damage. The damage was rated in the entire plant means based on the frost presence or not. And this is subjective and probably we need to go further in, on how to do that. And you see again here, but this information almost correspond to what's the presence of corn earworm here on top. So very few numbers or almost no damage in the endurance uh, product. In addition to finding this, uh, these uh, caterpillars, also we found that there was uh, some larvae that have BT natural infection. So I think that's all I have right now. I don't know if you have any questions. I will be until the end. Thank you.